2 Corinthians. Let's go back there. You see those two songs there. The first one, Tazama, Ishi. Today we begin to see what that means from 2 Corinthians. What does that mean? And then we have just sung a prayer. We have said, give me vision to see things like you do. And you know some, many times we we sing, but we, we forget very quickly what we are singing. Because songs are powerful, but songs are also very weak. 
we forget very easily. And not only that, we can sing, but we are not even aware of what we are singing. In fact, that's a problem I've seen with so many people. And you can tell when someone is singing, and they are not even aware of what they are singing. I'm not this kind of a I'm not a I'm not a very good singer, and I'm, I'm not a I'm not a, I'm not someone who sings often. But when you find me singing, either alone in my car or just in the house or something like that, there must be something about that song in my spirit and in my heart. And I'm very much aware of those words that I'm singing. So when we are singing, give me vision to see. Um, yeah, that is our whole sermon. Can go home. But many of us are not able to handle that because we don't even know what that means. And so last week, we did a very broad sweep of 2 Corinthians. And we saw the suffering of the man of God. We saw the man of God suffering. We did a sweep completely. The whole book, we, we trying to look at uh, how he describes suffering. We reviewed how his ministry looked like or looked like the difficulties. We looked at the pain. We looked at the afflictions. We looked at the torturous journeys, the shipwrecks, the beatings, even physical beating. We saw that. Physical beatings. 40 minus 1 beatings. Hostility from brothers and false teachers. From Jews and Gentiles. We saw that. And in the midst of all these, what, what comes to us as surprise is the daily burden for all the churches of Jesus Christ that Paul has already burned. Planned it. The pain and the suffering does not stop him from carrying the burden that is primary in his life. There's a primary, there's a primary burden in his life. There's a primary vision. There's a primary call in his life. That call, that vision has caused him serious suffering, difficulty, and trouble. Yet, the difficulties, the suffering, the afflictions has not distracted him from the main cause of his life. And we found ourselves, we found asking ourselves, what is it that is so unique with this man that he's not distracted? We wondered what kind of a man is Paul. We wondered what kind of a perspective does this man have? That gives him the capacity, the audacity to live the kind of life he lives. The Corinthians are people who have troubled him. Yet, he is back there three times. Yet, he has written four letters to this church. The most difficult church. The church that has given him the most troubles and difficulties. Yet, it is the church that has received more letters from Paul, more visits from Paul than any other church. What makes this man live that kind of life? And in passing, I mentioned that I said is a certain kind of perspective. Paul has a certain kind of perspective, what I call an eternal perspective. That is what guides him. That's what guides him. And today we come into this section. That starts in chapter 3 and runs to chapter 7. A very major section in the letter. Where Paul is now very clear. He lays down his perspective for us. He tells Corinthians, this is who I am. Together with my team. This is who we are. That's why we love you so much. That's why you never get us tired. Because this is who we are. This is who we are. He brings about this vision very clear from these, uh, these four or five chapters. Very clear. He tells us exactly why he does what he does in the midst of such hostility and pain. He tells us exactly in plain words. He doesn't hide it. He tells us plainly. What makes him go on and on despite all that he goes through. And the answer is very simple. You know, some of you might be expecting an answer from heaven. 
Of course it is from heaven, but the answer is very, very simple. It's very, very plain. It's here in the text. He tells us, Paul tells us, that he has kept his focus on Jesus. And that's the answer. He tells us that he has kept his gaze on Christ. He tells us that he has kept his eye on the glory of Christ. Not on the glory of himself. He doesn't want to be a big man. He doesn't want to be known. That is not his glory. That is not his focus. That's not where his eyes are. His eyes are on Christ and his glory. And so he keeps his gaze upon the man, Jesus Christ. He keeps his focus upon the man, Jesus Christ. And as he does that, he is sustained. As he does that, God sustains him. Because when you gaze at Jesus, when you look at Jesus, when you tell Jesus, I want your vision, not my vision, and you go for it, what happens is, as you constantly look at him, there in Jesus, there in the face of Jesus Christ, you meet God the Father. And when you have seen God the Father, when you have met, G when you have met God the Father, then you are sure of your sustain sustainability. You are sure he will sustain you. So that's the answer. That's the answer. That's the answer. The answer is, I have been keeping my eyes not on the trouble, not on the pain, not on the suffering, not on the false brothers and false sisters and Gentiles and shipwrecks and afflictions and difficulties. I've not kept my eyes there. My eyes have focused them on Jesus. And when I look at him, I see the Father. And when I see the Father, I am sustained. That's the answer. That's the answer. And you remember, Paul met Christ on his way to Damascus. And that encounter of both salvation and calling, both salvation and commission, finally turned the light on Paul. It finally turned the light on Paul. And we need that turning constantly. He had been so blind. He was a religious man. Before that encounter, on the way to, to Damascus, he was a very religious man. He loved God. He loved God. He loved the Jewish God. He's a monotheist. He is fighting for the, Jew, for, the, for the Jewish God. That's what he's doing. He is fighting for the Jewish religion. He is a religious man. His scriptures are the Old Testament. That's what he carries as he wages war, a jihad against the Christians. He is carrying the Bible, the Old Testament. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews, trained under the tutorings of the best of the Pharisees, Gamaliel. But that light, that light completely transformed Paul. He saw Jesus face to face. And his life was never the same again. It worries me so much. When you meet Christians all over the place. And they tell you how they have encountered Jesus. They tell you the visions they have heard about Jesus. They tell you about the dreams they have heard about Jesus. And how the word of God has come upon them. Yet you look at their lives. And their lives show no transformation at all. There is no change at all. They are the most selfish Christians. They are the most greedy Christians. They do whatever they do. Their behaviors are contrary to what they are saying. It is because they have not met Jesus. They have met their own Jesus on the streets. The Jesus they know is the Jesus of their dreams at night. It is the Jesus of their vision, visions at night. But when we meet the real Jesus, when we meet the real Jesus, the real Christ like Paul, we are totally transformed. He saw Jesus face to face and his life was never the same again. And that was not enough. 
He continued to stare at him. He continued to look at him again and again, again and again. And when he does that, when he does that, when he does that, in the midst of difficulties and pain and shipwreck and stoning, when he does that, he sees God. He sees God. He sees the Father. He sees his mission. He sees his will for the nations and the cosmos. He sees the purposes for which the world was created. And he cannot stop doing what he does because he has seen it. Because he has seen it, even if it kills him physically, he says, as we saw last week, I better boast on the things that display my weakness. For when I am weak, I am strong. That is the perspective, friends. That is what keeps Paul going. That is what keeps some of us going. Even in the midst of great austerity against us. And the word of the gospel. And what is, what is it that sustains us? What is it that will sustain you? In the days ahead. Because the days ahead will not be nice. The days ahead will be difficult. The days ahead are difficult. What will sustain you? We will meet more hostility. Against God. And again, it's his purposes. What is it that will sustain you? That's a question. And I don't think there's a different answer. Paul has given us an answer. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. He has given us an answer. Now the Lord is spirit. Is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, we all, that is Paul and his company, Paul and his team. And of course, those who like Paul have gotten into this journey. Those who like Paul are looking at Jesus, are staring at Jesus. Those who like Paul, their guess, their guess is Jesus Christ. He says, and we all, with unfailed face. Beholding, look at that. Beholding, that one means seeing and looking and gazing and looking, focusing. Beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Beholding, beholding, not that word. Beholding, looking, gazing, focusing. Having an eye on something and you do not allow distraction. If there's a man who should be distracted, it is Paul. So much happening around him. He should be distracted. But he has, this, he has sent no to distraction and he is constantly gazing, looking, beholding, fissioning. And what is he looking at? The Lord. The glory of the Lord. And when we locate the glory of God, the glory of God is located on the face of Jesus Christ. That's what you say. That's where it is located. Look at 4 verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, even if our gospel is veiled, or whatever, what, what that means is, to some people they may not see what we are talking about. We will shout it. We will preach it. We will share it as close as we can. We will come close and share it as much as we can. But even though what we are sharing will not be understood, some of us will not understand it. Even though our gospel is veiled, verse 3, it is veiled to those who are perishing. If the gospel that we preach is hidden, it is not being understood. It is not being understood by those who are perishing. Verse 4, in the case, in their case, in their case, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That's why they cannot see. That's why they cannot guess. 
That's why they cannot focus. That's why their eyes are somewhere else. Because they are unbelievers. But they are in church. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from beholding, from focusing, from seeing, from looking. Can you see it? That's what the devil does. Distractions engineered by people, engineered by the devil, engineered by Satan are meant to stop you from gazing, from beholding, from looking. Because when you stop looking, when you stop gazing, when you stop focusing on the right object of your faith, then you cannot see. You cannot see. You cannot see. And what do we see? We see the light. The light that turned Paul from that crazy religious Hebrew of Hebrew, a persecutor of the church. The light that changed him. When he saw it, is what is what we see. And when we see the light, we see God, the Father. And that's how he has sustained. That's how he has sustained. When we see the light, what light? The light, look at those, look at those prepositions there. The light of the gospel, of the glory, of Christ. Look at that. Possessional prepositions. The light. Which light? The light that belongs to the gospel. Which gospel? The gospel that belongs to the glory of Christ. The gospel of glory. Which glory? Not just any other glory. Not the glory of man. Not the glory of things, material blessings, and whatever. The glory of Christ. And who is Christ? The image of God. And so when we see Christ, we see God. When we see God, we have seen the Father. When we have seen the Father, we are sustained. Even in the midst of trouble and pain and difficulty. And all sorts of things thrown on our way. By the devil, by demons, by people. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. When we have met the Father, we are sustained. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, I'm preaching to myself. Do you, did you realize that? I'm preaching to myself. I'm feeling nice as I preach this. Because I'm talking to Meshach. Because Meshach keeps landing on trouble. Because of the gospel. I keep, I keep landing in tr into trouble with the people, with relatives, with you people. How am I going to be sustained? My guess is at Christ. My guess is at the gospel. My guess is at Christ, the image of God, from where I meet my heavenly Father who loves me. Who loves me. And because he loves me. He will sustain me. In difficulties. And in afflictions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at verse 6. It's here. The answer is here. I'm not trying to craft some nice message for you people. The answer is right here. How did Paul survive? The answer is right there. Verse 6. For God who said, let there be light, let light shine of darkness. Where did he say that? Genesis 1. That's where he said it. That's when he said it. That's where he says it. Let there be light. That God, that God who said that has shone in our hearts, in my heart. He has shone in our hearts to give the light, to give the light. What light? The knowledge. The, the light. Look at those prepositions once again. Possessive. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face. The face of Jesus Christ. So where is, where is light found? Where is light found? Because you need light. And many times we are in darkness. 
Many times we find ourselves in darkness. Gloom, darkness. Dark, darkness. In relationships, businesses, at work. You know, darkness. Where do we find light in such moments? Where did Paul find light in such moments? Where did he find light? He found light because God is Father. God is Father said, let there be light. But then how did he say, how did he do that? He, how did he do that? Paul looked at Christ in the Old Testament. Because there's nowhere else he could find Christ. His Bible, the same Bible he used to persecute Christians. He went back to the same Bible, this time with a different eye. And he saw Christ. Every passage he read, it was Christ. And as he saw Christ, darkness was dispelled. As he, as he looked into the Old Testament, darkness was dispelled. It was the Father saying, let there be light in his heart. And as light came, as light came, it came with knowledge. It came with knowledge. It came with knowledge. And what kind of knowledge? Not philosophical knowledge. Not mathematical knowledge, not CRIE, not geography. It is knowledge that has got to do with the glory of God. And where is that glory located? That glory is located in the face of Jesus Christ. That is the man to stare, friends. That's the man to stare. Remove your eyes on your husband. Can you say amen to that? Remove your eyes on your wife. Say amen to that. Remove your eyes on your employer. And whoever else you are trusting, parents, government, sponsors, NGOs, remove your eyes from these institutions and locate yourself. Locate yourself in Jesus. And even when trouble beats you, even when the devil comes to distract you, Make sure you stay your gaze on Jesus Christ. Hebrews will say he is the finisher. He is the starter. He is the one who starts our faith. And he is the one who will finish it. And so he says, he says, fix your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on him. Paul is saying that. The author of Hebrews is saying that. John is saying that. Luke is saying that. Peter is saying that. What else do you want? What else do you want? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Guess upon him. Hallelujah. He's right there. In the book. It's right there in the book. I am not trying to make this up. Paul together with his team have their eyes fixed on something. Their guess is Jesus. The eye, their eyes are on the face of Jesus Christ. Their focus is not the troubles and the pains and the confusions. You know, some of you stood here last Sunday and you said, I'm confused. I'm a bit confused. I don't understand this. I don't understand that. I'm a bit confused. Some of you stood here on Sunday and you said that this is the end of your confusion. Remove your eyes from your adolescence. <laughs> Remove your eyes from your 20s, Daniel. Remove your eyes from those things. Get your eyes back on track. Get your eyes back on focus. Get your mind. Your eyes speak about your mind. Get your mind back on on track. Align your mind. And how do you do that? You align your mind by gathering it and commanding it to fix its focus on no one else but Christ and him alone. That's the opposite of what the world tells us. It's the opposite of what the world tells us. The world tells us we can beat our suffering. <laughs> That's what the world tells us. The world tells us if only we can get this or that, we can deal with our afflictions. 
We can deal with our suffering. The world tells us we can reduce our pain. That's what the world's wisdom tells us. It tells us all we need is a better job. All we need a career. All we need is money. All we need is sex. All we need is love. All we need is fame, reputation, celebrity, change jobs, get married. Leave that marriage. That's what the world says. Get a political position. Become an MP. Immigrate to somewhere in California. That's what the world tells you. And you will reduce your pain. You will reduce your suffering. You will reduce the things that are distracting you. That's what the world says. That's the voice of the world. And I'm very much aware that the voice of the world is louder than the voice of music. I'm very much aware. Very much aware of that. Even here, as I preach like this, there are voices fighting against my voice. Here, here in Gospel Life this morning. There are voices, there are voices in your mind that are fighting the voice of God in this moment, in this hour. The world keeps telling us that we can reduce our suffering by doing all these things, by getting all these things. Get a medical cover, the world says, so that when cancer strikes, you can reduce your pain and your suffering. And still it strikes. And you are still able to avoid a ticket all the way to India in some medical facility. But let me tell you, at that point, with all the medical facilities you have, with all the insurance you have, you are still the most miserable human being on the face of the earth, together with your family. Because we are locating our faith, we are locating our hope in the wrong place. We are told get an accident cover. Anything can happen. A house, your house can burn. You can get an accident on the road with a matatu or even driving your own car. Get an accident cover. There's nothing wrong with that. Please go ahead and get it. But can I tell you this? There's no security in an accident cover. There is no security. There is no security in a medical cover. You can have the best medical cover. Okay? And drive at night like Mishek to a Gagan hospital, the best hospital in Kenya. And spend at least 12 hours with those doctors there and they discover Gagan hospital, the best hospital in this country. And you go back home to die or from God to save you somehow. And somehow Somehow, God, in his mysterious ways, because he's mysterious, but he's also my father. He's mysterious, but he's a father. Somehow, somehow, I find my ways in Kinjambe Mission Hospital. Kinjambe Mission Hospital is just like level five. There is no much difference. I moved from Aga Khan, the best. I learned in Kinjambe Hospital, maybe the worst. And there, and there, I find my salvation. Who told you that your salvation is a medical cover? Because it's not. Who told you that your salvation is a medical cover? Because by a medical cover, you will be able to go to a good hospital and find the best doctors. I hand them, three of them, for about 12 hours. Augusta was present, Stella was present, Penina was present. About 12 hours. But on that Friday, I went home without help. Put, we, must, we must learn to put our trust somewhere else and not even our medical facilities. Not the things that we can afford. You cannot afford. We need to put our eyes and our gates on the right, the right place. And that place is called the face of Jesus Christ. The face of Jesus Christ. And then when, when we do all these things that they do not work, we face death. We work ourselves to death looking for money. Trying to gain as much money as possible. Trying to gain a better, a better life. Trying to buy a better life on the earth. 
as much as possible. And as we do that, we are losing people. We are losing our children. We are losing our families. We are losing our relationships. We get all these things, but nothing changes. The more we work hard, the more the earth becomes under. That's it. The more we work hard, the more the earth becomes under. The more we can't make sense of our relationships. The more we work hard, the more we cannot make sense of our relationships. Our relationships even become more harder to deal with. Whether those relationships be marriage, parents, friends, colleagues, brothers, and sisters in gospel life. Gospel life. I want to remind you today, please, please go ahead and get these things. Buy the next car and the next plot. Get the best medical cover. Do that if you can. Do whatever you can. Work hard. But you think, if you're thinking that those things will give you and protect you from suffering, you are lying to yourself. You have been lied to by the devil. We need to listen to God. We need to listen to Paul. We need to gain a perspective from Paul. Paul lived in a day when there were no medical insurances. He lived in a day when there were no medical facilities. We live in a different day. And because we live in a, in a different day, technology has really lied to us that we can live our lives. We are even going ahead to create babies. Stem cell babies. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what they are doing in America. Clone, to clone babies, to clone human beings. Because we think with technology, we are going to go. We can put God aside. So go ahead and get whatever you can get. But let me tell you, my brothers and my sisters, my sons in the faith, let me remind you this. We need to listen to God. We need to listen to Paul because he has a perspective. And this perspective is the eternal perspective. All the others will fail. They will fail and they will fail miserably. They will fail and they will fail miserably. It is the perspective that will stand when all the others have failed and proved useless. The more we can make sense of this reality, the more we remain in darkness. We must keep our gaze on Jesus. We must keep our eye on him. Having one focus Jesus Christ, him only, and his glory. That was Paul's purpose and focus. And it will not be different for you guys. It will not be different for me. That is the focus. Begin today, today, now. Begin aligning your mind. Begin aligning your mind. I know all of us here, all of us here are facing issues. There is no human being here who doesn't face issues. Issues. Issues surround us. Issues around us. Whether with our closest friends, closest family members, or even with employers and employees, colleagues at work, students, fellow students, even a makanga in a stage and the driver in a matatu, issues surround us. Sicknesses. Sicknesses, pain, sometimes emotional pain, mental breakdown, issues surround us, issues around us. If it is not you with an issue, you are most immediate friend as an issue that you cannot sleep because you are thinking about how you can help. Let me advise you, friends, let me advise you. You need to move your eyes and your mind from the issues and gain your gaze at Christ. And as you look at Christ, as you look at Christ, there shall be light. There shall be light 
in any form of darkness, there shall be light. And that light shall bring you into the presence of the Father. And your Father, your Heavenly Father, will sustain you.
Chukuu 